Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rabbi şirah li sadri ve sivri emniye rahmet veren ve lisani yapan kavmi. Selamünaleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve berekatuhu. İnşallah we will start with a new word. 24th word. So we're on the 24th word. This word consists of five branches. Study the fourth branch carefully and hold on to the fifth branch and climb it, then pluck its roots. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. God, there is no God but He. His are the most beautiful names. We shall indicate five branches of one of the many truths from the luminous tree of this glorious verse. First branch. A sultan has different titles in the spheres of his government. A king has different titles in the sphere of his government and different styles and attributes among the classes of his subjects and different names and signs in the levels of his rule. For example, just judge in the judiciary, uh, sultan or king in the civil service, commander in chief in the army, and caliph in the learned establishment. Uh, if making an analogy with these, you know the rest of his names and titles, you will understand that a single king may possess a thousand names and titles in the spheres of his rule and levels of government. It is as if, through his corporate personality and telephone, the ruler is present and knowing in every sphere, and through his laws and regulations and representatives, sees and is seen, and behind the veil in every degree, disposes and sees governs and observes through his decree, knowledge, and power. It is exactly the same for the sustainer of all the worlds, who is the ruler of pre-eternity and post-eternity. In the degrees of his dominicality, he has attributes and designations which are all different, but which look to each other. And in the spheres of his godhead, he has names and marks which are all different, but which are one within the other. And in his magnificent activities, his representations and appellations, which are all different, but which resemble each other. And in the disposals of his power, he has titles, which are all different, but which hint of one another. And in the manifestations of his attributes, he has sacred appearances, which are all different, but which show one another. And in the displays of his acts, he has wise disposals, which are of numerous sorts, but which complete one another and in his multicolored art and varieties of creatures, he has splendid aspects of dominicality, which are all different, but which look to one another. And together with this in every world, in every realm of beings, the title of one of the most beautiful names is manifested. And together with this in every world, in every realm of beings, the title of one of the most beautiful names is manifested. In each sphere, one name is dominant and the other names are subordinate to it. Rather, they are there on account of it. Furthermore, in every level of beings, many or few, great or small, particular or general, he has an appearance through a particular manifestation, a particular dominicality, a particular name. That is to say, although the name in question is general and encompasses everything, it is turned towards a thing with such an intention and importance that it is as if it is special to that thing alone. Although the name in question is general and encompasses everything, it is turned towards a thing with such intention and importance that it is as if it is special to that thing alone. Moreover, although the all-glorious creator is close to everything, there are almost 70,000 luminous veils obscuring him. You can compare how many veils there are from the particular degree of creativity of the name of creator, which is manifested on, to, on you to the greatest degree, and supreme title, which is creator of all the universe. That means on condition you leave the whole universe behind you, from the door of creativity, you may reach the limits of the name of creator and draw close to the sphere of attributes. The veils have windows which look to one another and the names appear one within the other, and the acts look to one another and the similitudes enter one within the other, and the titles hint of one another and the manifestations resemble each other and the disposals assist and complete one another, and the various dispositions of the medicality help and assist one another. 
It surely therefore necessitates not denying the other titles, acts, and degrees of dominicality when Almighty God is known through one of his names, titles, or degrees of dominicality. Indeed, it is harmful if the transition is not made from the manifestation of any one name to the others. For example, if the works of the names of all powerful and the creator are seen, and not the name of all knowing, a person may fall into heedlessness and misguidance and the misguidance of nature. He should always keep in view and recite he, and he is God. He should listen and hear from everything, say he is God, the one. His tongue should utter and proclaim, all the world declares there is no God but he. Thus, through the decree of God, there is no God but he. His are the most beautiful names. The Quran points to these truths we have mentioned. I have one sentence that really, like when we get there, I'd like to discuss the end of the second paragraph. In each sphere, one name is dominant, and the other names are subordinate to it. Rather, they are there on account of it. So I think there is great things hidden there that I currently don't see, but when we get there. Any other points that you want to highlight so that we be sure that we don't miss them? Okay, let's start from the beginning, shall we? First branch. A king has different titles in the spheres of his government and different styles and attributes among the classes of his subjects and different names and signs in the levels of his rule. For example, just judge in the judiciary. Judiciary. Judiciary. Okay. In the judiciary, king in the civil service, commander in chief in the army, and caliph in the learned establishment. What is the origin of the learned establishment? Ulema, I guess, yes, okay. Or something similar, yes. Yeah. Um, if making an analogy with these, you know the rest of his names and titles, you will understand that a single king may possess a thousand names and titles in the spheres of his rule and levels of government. So why he is talking about all these different titles, names? I have a question about the verse. Um, do you know the verse when he talks about uh, God teaching the names of uh, names to Adam? Uh, it just there in that verse does it say just names or it, it's names of something? Like does it mention what names? How, what? All of them, he says. Esmaha kullaha, right? Yes, uh, es, Esmaha kullaha. So okay. And but it's it, just as no, nothing. Nothing. Nothing comes like as the name to first. Okay. No possession. Uh, no adjective. And here in the verse, he says like, "There is no God but He." His are the most beautiful names. So whatever he taught Adam, there in the verse, mm -hmm. whatever he's, he's, a connection. yeah, he's refer like um, whatever that verse referring there must have a connection with the verse here. In that sense. Any other comments or with the first part? Please share what you understand from our online participants. If you like to share your thoughts, please go ahead. Um, so, okay, from my side, so it's talking about the different ways that we know about a king. Right? So, in this analogy, most of times you don't see the king, you don't have access to the king, but you know him through whatever he does. Like, for instance, he establishes a judiciary system. Uh, I'm just trying to learn the word. And then acts there, and through his actions in this system, you know about him one of his qualities at least you know that oh 
whoever established this judiciary system, he knows about uh, justice. Uh, also, you look at the army and you say, okay, whoever you know, established this army, whoever controlling is this army, you must be knowing about uh, the art of war. So this is the relationship that you have with a king. So you, I don't know, you walk on streets, you look at the roads, they're all bumpy, and you know that the, whoever is the head of the city, he's a terrible guy, he doesn't know how to correct the roads, right? So I don't know, the, for instance, whoever is responsible in Philadelphia. I've seen the guy, I guess, once in a seminar, but anyway. Other than that, I don't know about him. But if he is in charge of these roads around you know, this block, uh, he's a terrible uh, governor or whatever. Mayor. Sorry? Mayor. Mayor. Mayor, yes. Whoever is in charge of the roads here. Department of Streets. <laughs> Department of Streets, yes. They, they don't work properly. I know that because I look at the roads. So I'm sure his mayor has also other you know, the titles, qualities that I can observe when I see a, I don't know, like a public school uh, or a hospital which serves public. If all these are in charge, like uh, under his control, I would say, yeah, he has such and such qualities. This is the way I know about the mayor through his works through his uh, actions. But the interesting thing, everywhere I look, I see a different quality of the same guy. So maybe he might be a really good organizer uh, because I see all these festivals, for instance, uh, which are great, just uh, for the sake of example. I say, okay, he has great uh, organizing capabilities. Uh, talents, but he doesn't have great talents when it comes to roads. So different aspects, different qualities of the same guy, I know from different uh, works, different actions. <clears throat> so like Nursi established beliefs and made the connection with them in the sub, with the with the maker, the creator of the universe in the 23rd world. So that was like the foundation, I guess. Now, like you, okay, now like I believe in the maker of the universe. I'm supposed to like have that like Rububuyet and Ubudi relationship. But how am I supposed to relate like stuff like? not established, like now it's the, that that connection is already established. Now the question is like, how do I really know him further? Like, I guess like, interact. The, yeah, like, in, not just interact, like you, you still need to like, it is, you established a belief in the maker who is beyond your reach, right? And you already established that connection. And now the question is like, how do I con communicate with him and how do I really like know him better? Because like knowing Yusuf as like a guy like works at UPenn is something different than Yusuf, like uh, the father of Zainab is completely different, right? What that in, in, in that like you see a different quality of yourself. Uh, so the same thing here, like, okay, God exists, but like, what kind of privacy then the verse comes like his all uh, the beautiful name the most beautiful names and then like how do I, how do I those names like look at the act and then the, the your own experiences becomes another means to get to know him better 
So you've reached the conclusion that there must be something, someone. He built this house. That's obvious, mm -hmm. you see. Uh, but this conclusion, it just stops there, right? You say, yeah, like, there I must think... be someone. But what kind of, like, what are you talking about? Like, what do you mean with someone? And then uh, you look at the walls, how they are built. You look at the windows, you look at, I don't know, the appliances, how they're uh, organized. So through these actions, through these makings, now this concept of the maker, is not being uh, disclosing himself to yes you. you know like how in the uh, last not last week the weeks before at least what i remember how like man's duty to like know the to look at the art to get to know him to understand his lordship and to see the beauty and like uh, do a reflection so he I think there, like he established that, like that's what you are supposed to do. Then the question is, like, is like, okay, how do I do it in in in practice? Like, how do I really do it? And also, like, how do I take it like further? Uh, it seems like this is the answer to that question. And he, that's what that's what he's doing here. First, you have to be sure that there is a king. First, you have to be sure that like, there, the, there is a mayor yeah, that takes care of You reach the conclusion like, that there is a king, yeah. yes, or there is a mayor. So this business. Then, yeah. like, he's very distant. Like, I don't even know the mayor of the Philadelphia. Like, who is the mayor? I have no idea. The same here, yeah. Uh, and let alone, like, knowing what kind of mayor or person he is, right? Uh, well, I was looking at the verse. So, in English, it, I mean, it's the same thing, but when you look at the Arabic, it becomes more like, uh, I guess, clear how the verse is going. Uh, like, you don't need to know Arabic to understand this, it's so simple. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa. So, first, describing is the method to reach to the maker of the house. So it's describing, okay, if you want to know, you know, what I mean when I say Allah, it's, you know, he's the one, there's no God but he. This is what I mean. Mm -hmm. So it's like your conclusion, okay, you look at the house, you say, okay, it can't be by That's itself. Like very good point. So Allahu, la ilaha illahu. Allah, the one who is, there is no like, uh, deity about him, right? So it's the definition. Definition. I don't know if definition or if it is. Uh, I mean, it's like a noun uh, sentence. So Allah is uh, the one. Yeah, exactly. So like or this description. This. So he is describing God in a way that like way too distant. Like okay, he is the one that there is no deity about him. Like. Uh, it's very, very, very abstract. Okay, I can like, through my experience saying that, okay, there must be a creator of this universe, but what kind of creator is he? Like, so unknown, so like, so distant from me. So I guess like, that's why you had the second part of the verse saying that his are the most beautiful names. So on one hand, like, I think maybe that is the reason I'm just like actually th thinking loud, not that I really know what I'm saying, but he talks about somewhere that he's being so away from you, but like seven, so close to you, but at the same time being behind the 70,000 veils. Where was it? Uh, glorious veils, almost seven, yeah. Mo moreover, although the old glorious creator is close to everything, that's the second paragraph mm -hmm. on the second page, there are almost 70,000 luminous veils obscuring him. It seems like that actually like kind of explain, in a way explains the verse as well, because uh, him being like creator of everything, I think describes like how he close, uh, the creator is close to everything, but at the same time, him being like behind like 70,000 veils is, 
explaining the, the names that are disclosed or like manifesting in the creation. So him being closed in terms of the creatorship is an aspect that looks to him, but being behind the 70,000 veils is an aspect that looks to me and like my way of communicating with him or my means of communication with him, I think I should say. I don't know if I'm making it more complicated or confusing you more, but it seems like there is that kind of relationship there too. So one thing while reading the verse again, which attracted my attention is, God, there is no God but He. His are the most beautiful names. So this is also kind of, uh, the second part is also kind of a conclusion of the first part. So first he says, okay, he is the one, uh, other than him there is no God, like you reach him as a conclusion, you say, okay, it can't be by itself, it can't be, I don't know, it's random, it can't be from nothing, uh, all this blueprint of this house cannot create it, whatever. So there must be a maker, he gives, he defines it uh, through a method, method not through some, I don't know, words. This is the method to describe him, he says, la ilaha illallah. If this is the case, like you uh, check it, you verify it. But he says also, like in the second part, he says, use the same method with everything you see in the creation. So when you see a name in the mm -hmm. creation manifested, or when you see a quality in the creation, apply use the, the same, same method, methodology. Yes, apply the same methodology, you will know that this quality also goes to him. Thus, his are the most uh, beautiful names. The most beautiful, whatever parts we probably we will discuss, but this, like I didn't realize it before, but I think I might be wrong. Uh, the connection between the two parts is the first part takes you a conclusion that there must be a creator, but the second part says, do not stop there. Everything you see in this creation, every quality you see in this creation, will also go to him, will be attributed to him, uh, because of the same method. And like, to add to what you said, so the first one is establishing the belief, and the second one, putting that like, that methodology or that understanding or that like, uh, logic or concept in practice, which is your ibadah, right? Mm. Uh, seeing, saying La ilaha for every single name, and through those qualities or through, through those names, reaching back to him over and over again, that is your like Ubudiyya again. And that is reinforcing that idea of there is no deity in terms of being the most merciful, the most like powerful, the most knowledgeable, the most wise. So with each quality, you are putting that in practice with every experience, like whatever those experiences that you go through in life. Sometimes it is like, negative in quotation marks, sometimes it is positive that you like. But in, in, in every case, like, that is the way to reinforce and remind yourself that like, they are not coming from themselves and they are just reflection of the maker. And so that they become like, becomes like means for you to be able to establish that relationship over and over again. Uh, sorry, Glenn. Uh, I don't know if I'm reading too much into the uh, metaphor in here, but <clears throat> the way author is putting the metaphors is, it looks like people are in touch with the king through a certain title. And in practice, this is, I guess, how it is happening. Like maybe king can speak to another king as the king, like king of everything. But when it comes to king speaking to a person, this person is going to be in touch with the king either as like uh, commander in chief or sultan, whatever, whatever. So when we say like la ilaha illallah is our sort of, I would say, intellectual conclusion, 
about defining or understanding the source of existence, what's going on in here. But when it comes to how am I going to interact with that absolute, because Allah in here pretty much means absolute. So what does it mean, me interacting with absolute? It is blank screen, it doesn't mean anything. But I know what it means to interact with merciful, because I do know what mercy is. I do not know what absolute is. By definition, absolute is undefinable. You cannot um, relate with them. And it's unconstrainable. It's not something that I can, I mean, it's just vacuum or emptiness, sort of. I mean, it's absolute, undefinable. But when it comes to mercy, I am interacting with the manifestation of mercy. I guess this is how uh, practically I can interact with my maker. And uh, one page before, it was like at the end of this belief, it brings topic to the supplication and saying that through supplication, now the com it becomes a conversation. This interaction becomes a conversation. But I was checking this verse, La ilaha illallah, La ilaha illahu, Nahum asma'ul husna. There is another verse which says, Walillahi um, asma'ul husna, fadu'hu biha. So the, all beautiful names are belonging to the Creator. So Ask from him with those names. Kaduhu is asking. Ask or uh, call. Do I, I found call? this on the web. <laughs> yeah, call. Call. Somebody's call. listening to us. <laughs> so call to him with those. Mm. As if it is teaching me how am I going to interact with him? This is how you can interact with him. Otherwise, it is like the self of the Creator, as I understand as self, is so unreachable. It is sort of a like, to me, Allah means in this case absolute. And absolute is by definition undefinable, unconstrainable, so it's totally unreachable. That reminded me something like I read years ago, like Ibn Arabi says that like the reason why there wasn't so many followers of Prophet Noah because he uh, was so like into glorification and tenzi like emphasizing on there is no deity but him in this creation so much that like he forgot uh to teach people how they can relate with him that's why like it was unimaginable pe for people to be able to connect with someone someone that is so out of touch they they were not able to comprehend what he's trying to do that's why they didn't, they didn't have many followers so like uh, that's an interesting uh, interpretation of the of the event, but like, and also like, maybe we shouldn't take it like uh, literally because he's a very figurative speaking person. But at the same time, I kind of I see that like why he would say that because uh, you want connection, right? And if he is. Uh, so out of touch, then it loses the meaning and the per like actually uh, it doesn't fit human, the value. Yeah, well, it doesn't fit human character. Let's put it this way: like human wants to interact, and apparently the one wants to interact with me as well, wants to be known, wants to be loved, but so out of my reach, it doesn't fit. It is against my footprint. He is not nature. relatable. Yeah. So I guess a relevant question then becomes, what do we mean by name? So I guess this part maybe we can uh, try to understand because if it's not, self is unrelatable. So what does it mean to be relatable with the creator then? Because absolute is unrelatable, but what is merciful? The names must be after yeah. So what do we mean by names, right? And how, how it is becoming more relatable when it is a name, but not like Allah or absolute, whatever. What do we mean by that? He is absolute. He is absolute with all his qualities or with all, with all his names. But your experience is created. Name is not created, but your experience is created. And your experiences are like whatever the manifestations that you experience they are all created and that's uh that are the reflection of those qualities that you observe
in other words like no matter what you are stuck with the universe and what you observe in the universe or what you experience in your own emotion in a way but again like are you gonna like take possession of your like all those emotions feelings and live as such or like you are gonna realize that actually someone is constantly uh, manifesting in your heart and changing those emotions like continuously so like just she answered in a simple way like names in one way like it refers to his absolute qualities but in in as far as i understand in on one hand it refers to his absolute quality but on the other hand since the only access you have is the manifestation of the, those names it, it refers to your experiences and like whatever it might be internal or external like in in but in yourself or in the in the creation in the uh, you know any comments questions <laughs> well, like it, when you say names yeah. are absolute what do you mean like can i say god is merciful for example you can conclude that god is merciful but like do you understand what his mercy is do you truly look, look I like saying no. he is merciful like you can like look at you just looking at the scenery over here can you like <laughs> <laughs> Before that, <laughs> can you like, can you define Yusuf as merciful? I don't care if I can define it though. No, okay. like, can you read that like if he's merciful or not from from the scenery? I can't I say can... that he's merciful. I can say that he has a lot of compassion for his daughter. Uh, because that's what I see. Like I observe it in front of my okay. eyes. But do I really know, like, truly know, like, how, like, what that compassion is, like, even in, in, in this relationship? Mm -hmm. So, like, if you cannot tell what for that relationship, is it really possible to observe the mercy, but at the same time, but you understand the mercy? Yeah, but like, you observe the mercy because it is reflected in a physical form, right? Okay. In that relationship. But that you don't truly really know, like how, like that confession, like how he really truly feels about her, his his daughter. You, you don't, in other words, you don't understand the, the intense or or the like multitude, not magnitude. multitude, magnitude of it. Okay, so you mean absolute intense. Like so, like if you take that analogy and apply your relationship to create that, like everything that we experience in the universe would be a reflection of the mercy, but. Is that truly really possible for us? Is it truly possible for us to understand what that mercy is as far as his uh, self is concerned? There is a comment from Suhail. He says hmm. he must be merciful. I guess there is an emphasis there. He must be merciful. To say is in quotation, to say is to actually demonstrate it. So, so the way I understand is like I will <coughs> explain, uh, but please go ahead and explain yourself as well. So he says he must be merciful to say is to actually demonstrate it. So I take it as you shouldn't say he is merciful uh, but you should say he must be merciful it continues hence why you have to make an observation and make a conclusion so this is why you have to make an observation and make a conclusion he says and then he concludes no experience no conclusion so so if you like Everybody here would enjoy your evaluation. Lovely voice. Definitely. It's easy to say, you know, God is this or God is that, or you know, he he is merciful. He's in, he is compassionate. But at, at least from you know my own experience, observation, when people generally say that, you know, I wonder if they're considering, as Osman was saying, like 
do you do you actually have a point of reference? Is there something you experienced in your life or you observed, either within yourself or out there, to, to come to that conclusion? Because when you say he is or he is this or he is that, you know, that that's what you're really saying is that's I can actually show you his mercy, God's mercy, not just a reflection, but in and of itself. You can't actually you can't show his mercy anywhere. I can show you the sun is yellow. I can point to and demonstrate it for you, but I can't show you his mercy. The best I can do, and really the only thing I can do, is to find it somewhere in the universe, whether within myself or in my experience with other people or other things. But I need that to act as a point of reference to in order to make a conclusion. And you have to make, you have to have an experience in order to make a conclusion. There is nothing else you, otherwise it's in a way, I mean, I, I don't, this kind of sounds a little bit harsh, but saying he is merciful or he uh, is compassionate or he is just is as baseless to say as so, in, in somebody who doesn't like, who doesn't believe that there is a God. So he says there is no mercy or he says there is mercy, but it's belongs to things themselves. There is compassion, but it belongs to things themselves. I can show you mercy and compassion and there it is. So both are making baseless statements. They're both, um, trying to demonstrate something that actually isn't true. The first person saying, I can show you God's mercy here, the actual manifestation of it. No, uh, sorry, the actual, it's actual essence here. That person can't do that. And the person who doesn't believe sa says, he, he or she either says, there is no mercy, can't demonstrate that, or says, there is mercy, but it belongs to the things themselves. It comes from within themselves. No, neither of those two groups can demonstrate that, that claim. So I know that Mercy has probably, I'm pretty sure he's said this. I've heard this from others too. If you witness knowledge, or if knowledge is being created, then the one that creates it also has to be knowledgeable, has to have knowledge, correct? Mm -hmm. So if I witness mercy, then the one that creates it, can I say that he must be merciful? He is merciful. Again, I'm not saying is in the terms that I can witness him. Yes, he is absolute, but I am still, because I do witness mercy, and mercy needs to be created by one that is merciful, I can say he is merciful. Is this correct? This is a logic that's used. That's a, because otherwise, if we say that we can't even attribute a quality to him, like I can't even call him merciful because he's absolute and the name is absolute, then it's just as <clears throat> untouchable as Allah or just absolute. I, don't, I think I, I agree with Suhail in terms of like, and also Birkan, like when he pointed out the fact that like there is no God but God, like that's like, uh, what did you call it, the methodology? So look, looking around, your own experiences and are trying to make sense of your own experiences. So this statement comes here saying that there is no God but uh, God, there is no God but He. He is the most beautiful name. So this is our the most beautiful name. So there's a statement and there is a claim. So like as far as I am concerned, how am I supposed to like really confirm the truthfulness of this verse? There is a claim and like like any like we do in life, right? When we establish a relationship with a person, we take the words and we look at the action, and if if we see there is any kind of parallelism between the words and the action, to establish to say that yes, this person is a trustworthy person. You just don't take the, like the word of the person saying that since he's saying that he's honest, I'm just gonna take his word for it. You don't do that. That's not how we live our lives. So when it comes to like establishing a like relationship with our creator, 
the Quran says that it's supposed to be his speech, that's what the claim is, and that says that he is like his are the most beautiful names. So it's a claim as far as we are concerned. So how are we supposed to really verify that and establish that relationship? The only thing that we have is like, okay, show me in your actions if that's true. And through our experiences, say that yes, and this I confirm this claim, and he must be so. As far as the language wise, whether you say he is or he must be, like I don't, I don't know how you want to express it yourself. But as far as the process goes, like I don't really know if there's another way of like really coming that sort of conclusion. I guess the most question can be asked in this way as well. When, for example, we were giving the example of Yusuf is merciful, actually we are going through the same process. You are observing the manifestation of mercy. So likewise, we should be saying that Yusuf must be merciful because he is treating his daughter in a merciful way. We tend to say Yusuf is merciful. How do you know that? Because I see that. In there we use is. But, uh, in here, why do we use must rather than is? Uh, I guess the way Suhail is approaching the topic is because by definition of my initial conclusions, uh, I was observing how the things are happening and then as long as I realize that the source must be absolute, the source of the manifestation of mercy that I am experiencing cannot be anything in this existence because I'm trying to see uh, where this mercy is coming from, is it coming from the carrots that I eat, is it coming from the water, whatever, going through these causal relationships. Eventually I say that nothing in this existence, which, which is the source of my understanding of shape, limits, forms and everything, cannot be the source of that. Therefore, the source of this mercy must be absolute. This is why is and is cannot be applied to absolute. I guess this is the gist of... Is, is mercy a quality that is of the nature of the universe? So then we will come there. But before coming to there, before trying to define what we mean by uh, is merciful or must be merciful. So the first part is, by definition, we shouldn't be using is when we talk about the absolute. I guess this is the nuance in there. But other than that, the same method has to be applied, must be sort of the conclusion, should also be applied when it comes to describing me as a creative being. Right? So, but we don't do that in day-to-day -day language. If this part is clear, then once I observe mercy in this existence, and also go through my steps of uh, contemplation and say that, uh, let, let's say the relationship between cat and kitten i do observe mercy because i i personally know what mercy means first this part is important i know what mercy is how did i learn no clue i was taught names already as a notion concept yeah this mercy is inherently if you like taught to me and i don't even know how to define mercy either but uh when i say god must be merciful what do I mean by that? Do I mean that he is uh, something like me? <laughs> because I am describing the source of mercy based on what I experience as mercy. So I guess this is where the problem starts. By this sentence, if I mean that, because uh, from your wording of the previous statement, it feels like if knowledge is coming, then that means knowledge was somewhere else before. So the thing is coming to here. Sort of equalizing uh, manifestation and the source. Because if I have a pool, let's say I'm opening the faucet in my kitchen, water comes. And then I say, well, this wherever this water, this water has to come from a source. It's not coming out. It is passing through the faucet. But the faucet is not the source, I know that. So wherever this is coming from, there's a plenty of water in there. If I apply the same logic like this and say that I do observe mercy is flowing through mother, but mother is not the source of this, wherever this is coming from, there's plenty of mercy, huge amount, but I know the gist of it. Then I'm truly defining source of mercy now. But and just 
like equalizing the yeah, Suhail is waiting for a long time so I'm sorry but after that I will sorry Suhail please go ahead no, Osman can go ahead that's fine I was just going to point out some like a danger there like equalizing the the, the, mo the most merciful one with the manifestation of the mercy that you experience here uh, I think that's the reason why like for example the there are thousand gods in, in, in Hindu, understand them. Or that's the reason why like there is this uh, Buddhist understanding that the universe, like because you already equalized the creator with the creation itself of the universe, now you are like all you, have, you are left with is the universe. Then in order to attain the peace, then you have to like leave everything behind and you have to reach the nirvana, which like emptying your mind and your like spirit like everything that is related to this world, but that is the way of attaining peace. So like, do you see where like it goes, like when you bring the two at the same, same level? Just a side note, like it's that becomes the same discussion topic, but that there is this aspect of it too. Like, I don't think people like really like force themselves to come up with like thousand dots, like just like as in, uh, entertainment it's because of the misconceptions of trying to understand the, the maker of the universe and then you uh, how should I say you equalizing the the attributes of the creator with the actual manifestations of it then uh, the cow is that like manifestation of mercy becomes your God and start like actually like seeing the cow as a deity that's why it is sacred. Uh, let's go with three um yeah to kind of add on to what uh yusuf and osman said so going back to the verse itself um as you guys pointed out allahu la ilaha illahu so the quran is like really kind of telling you as you guys talked about how to investigate who he must be. So, illa, I mean, you can translate it as, as but, but in other, in essence, what illa is saying, illa who, is it's, in, it's, it's telling you that this must be your conclusion. In other words, um, God, who is God? It's like, it's like opening up a dictionary. Okay, the entry for God, who is God? There is no God, or other words, there is no deity in the things I observe in this universe, except it must be him or, or the one out of the nature of the universe. Illa, that's a conclusion. And the Quran is telling you that's how you get there. This is who God is because he must be a one that you look to conclude from your experience of the universe by examining that there is actually no godhead within the universe the qualities that things have they don't have any godhead onto themselves but it only belongs to him a one that's who he must be that's what illa really is signifying it's a conclusion it's an inference a deduction and um you know to him are the most beautiful names which is just a continuation of that because if you think about it when you like know somebody you don't really know them th through their name like god allah i mean you know or um in judaism it's what yahweh i think i mean like it's like kind of meaningless honestly if, if i tell you my name so that's sort of meaningless in and of itself or osman or Birkan or yusuf like um like what what is that what does that mean it doesn't mean anything but I know something or someone or really for that matter, anything in the universe through a quality it demonstrates. And that's what the problem is pointing out is that the, the way you interact with something in the universe is through a quality it demonstrates, not that's what is of like the quality and the thing itself are of the same. It's the same essence. There's no, there's no, a person named, Birkan and then his qualities separately. It's the same thing. That's what makes Birkan Birkan. So it doesn't, 
that's what the Quran is like, at least telling me in this verse, is that when I see something, I'm actually interacting with qualities. The question is, though, do those qualities have any Godhead? And it, the Quran is saying there is no Godhead in those qualities in and of themselves, except that it belongs to him. And what makes those qualities belong to him most or beautiful is because they're belonging to him, because they must be absolute. That's what makes them beautiful. That's what, perfection is, there's nothing more beautiful than perfection. Um, the second thing I wanted to add was, or uh, a second and third thing, kind of tying to what Osman said. Um, you know, I, it, it, like, for example, let's say, you know, Osman and Yusuf are parents and let's say they come to me and they say oh i we are merciful or compassionate parents okay that's great i mean you, you can anybody can say whatever they want they can say they're the best parents ever but the fact is they speak from from their first-hand perspective first person perspective so osman can say i am a merciful parent but that doesn't mean anything for me he can say so God can say, I am most compassionate. Well, it's obvious because he's speaking on his own behalf. He doesn't need to conclude that he's most compassionate to himself. He's saying it, I am, because that's him. He's speaking. He knows who he is. But as Osmo was pointing out, the only way I can know that statement to be like anywhere close to being true is I actually have to investigate, wait, you can say that, but does it necessarily make it true? Well, as as he says in his own speech, you need to look to the things I, with this universe itself, and make that conclusion. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is uh, talking to what Osmo was saying, like not to get sidetracked, but that's essentially when when somebody says, you know, if you go down the road of saying, you know, I found God, and I found His mercy in the universe. I mean, maybe somebody doesn't mean it, but it's a very slippery slope to say, okay, here is his mercy. And then there's a sort of mixing of God and in his creation to the point that you may not even be able to separate the two. And to me, that's what, you know, Wahid al-Wujud is and what Norsi talks about quite frequently. The painter and the painting become one and there is no distinction because there is no conclusion. You don't need to make a conclusion when you're saying there is mercy in the universe and it's God's mercy and I see it right now. I mean, it's a, people may not necessarily mean that like intentionally, but that's the trajectory you go down. Uh, I don't know if maybe after a month can continue with if because uh, I think like there must have left some questions in there. I mean, I guess I'm having difficulty explaining it too, but I'm not going against any of the, you must look at existence to make conclusions. But when I'm too scared to even look past this existence because he is absolute, I can't make any conclusions or I can't think about anything about him then I see mercy within this existence. I see I am being enveloped in mercy, let's say. But then I can't say he is merciful. Okay, he must be merciful because I see his mercy. In my mind, that's the same thing as saying he is merciful for me because I've concluded it. He is merciful. Like I can say this quality and I'm not sure what's wrong with this. So when you say he is merciful, I mean, from my perspective and how I experience it, for me, he is merciful. Yeah. So, uh, when you say your mother is merciful, let's compare the two. Your mother is merciful and you are, let's say, you are in need of mercy. You want to be loved. You want to be cared for. And uh, you are interacting with your mother through the channel of mercy if you like. How, how do you feel when you say, my mother is merciful? So, or let's give it this way, uh, my mother is patient, let's say. You know that there's a threshold of mercy, uh, 
patience of your mother and you don't like to go beyond this threshold. Although maybe you cannot define uh, what your mother's patience looks like, like does it have salt in it, does it have water in it, but you know that there's a threshold, there's a limit of it. And then uh, you wouldn't like, this way maybe you can uh, describe it in a sense. Still you cannot totally define what it is, but you can describe it to, to, to some extent. But through this attributes of your mother like this, because what, if I ask you what is your mother, and if you just start counting, you will see that your mother is a combination of, a unique combination of uh, patience, uh, love, mercy, and all these things, right? Good My food. mother's hmm? good food. Good food. So my mother is going to be another different, unique combination of the similar attributes. But when it comes to the source of these, and all our la ilaha illa, who part of it is, our conclusion says, I don't know really. I cannot define anything about him. Is he a combination of this, a combination of that? This much of mercy, that much of compassion or patience? Even I cannot say that. He is absolute. That's all I can say about him. Yet, I want to interact with him. And I do observe mercy in this existence. Like, I do observe manifestation of mercy from my mother. I do observe manifestation of mercy in existence. Or, actually, I observe mercy. Forget about manifestation part of it. I observe mercy. And I call it manifestation because it's not self-sustaining. It is being given. This is why we call it manifestation. Right? So then, what is the relation of mercy that I observe at its source versus mercy that I observe from my mother and my mother? Because we tend to have a feeling, if I can feel your question, we tend to have a feeling like, I know the type of relationship between my mom's verse, mercy and my mom. And this is why I call my mother merciful. And when I call, I observe mercy in the existence, and God is merciful. Automatically, I would like to establish the same sort of relationship, same sort of description. But this is now contradicting my initial conclusion of him being absolute. Then now I fall into a dilemma. So if I am not able to interact with the creator as I'm interacting with my mother, how am I going to interact with my creator? Because the issue is my intellect, I don't want, I want to interact with my creator through mercy because this is my only way to do it. Yet I don't want to contradict with my intellect. So how do I do that? And I think this conversation is about this right now because otherwise you will realize that you are in need of mercy and you will say that, oh, the one that is manif that whose manifestation is all the mercy that I see, I am in need of your mercy. So how did I form the sentence? I always stay in the side of creation now. I did not try to define him or define limits of his mercy or anything because whatever I know about mercy is in this existence. So this is why no matter how hard I try, I cannot pass the boundary of contingency. Mm -hmm. So this existence, like the text that you sent a few days ago, so two wings of the messenger, like the splitting of the moon, two, two wings, and in there, uh, coming to the boundary of one of the spheres, this is at best what you can do. One of the spheres is this existence. And at best, what you can do is you can come to the boundary of it. So it's not possible to pass beyond it. So it's not, I mean, not possible. And this is what's happening to you right now. You're saying that, how am I going to interact with him? I want to say that he is merciful. But if I say he is merciful, I, I say my mother is merciful. And I am defining my mother, but God was absolute. So did I define him or did I not define him? So when I say my mom is merciful, I mean one thing. When I say God is merciful, I mean something else. Or I should mean something else. I should be aware that I am meaning something else. This is why I need to train myself how to interact with the merciful. What do I mean when I interact with the merciful? 
And I think uh, this is a uh, fundamental problem in humans' thought, because since we, we always think like this, when it comes to understanding the uh, things related to the unseen or raib, this is generally the source of problem. We are trying to define uh, the absolute. Same issue is going to be uh, valid again when it comes to the topic of divine determining or the nature of free will. As much as I try to define the nature of God's will, let's say, this is where the issue is coming from. I am trying to define my will and I just sense what it means to choose. And my feeling of choosing, I am likening it to God is also choosing, I say. Then now they are shoulder to shoulder. His choice is bigger than my choice. This is being my notion of. Then the topic of divine determining becomes unsolvable. Because I am dragging the topic into a place where it is unsolvable anyways. I am trying to define God's absolute will, but I cannot. So this is why I should know what is my boundary and which is something that I cannot pass beyond. And if I try to pass beyond this, yeah, I will definitely am going to struggle there. I mean, it is, so then what is the solution? I need to know how it is the proper way to interact with the absolute source then. By, and to my understanding, always staying at the side of knowing the boundary, not trying to pass it anyways, because it's not possible anyways. Always staying in the sphere of existence and speaking to the absolute, saying that, or oh, the one whose, manifest, whose manifestation is the mercy that I am observing, I am in need of mercy. I appreciate mercy that I see over here. So I am now having this conversation with the one still, but through something that I, I can name. And this is what I understand when in the paragraph he says, uh, 70,000 luminous veils. Those names are veils themselves. So, quick question. Like, so do you think we, <clears throat> the problem like stems from the, uh, the human attempt to comprehend the absolute because like the way for our learning the way that we like uh learn in life like we define things right like we put boundaries around it uh so like we can understand that in relation to this surroundings or mm -hmm. and when it comes to absolute the absolute itself the definition of absolute is like him being uncomprehensible or incomprehensible. What's the word? Yeah. Incomprehensible. The absolute means he is incomprehensible. So you are trying to comprehend something that is incomprehensible. And that's why I think is that the, do you think that's where the, the root is? Yeah. So trying to like put a bond around it but you are trying to like put a bond around something that is uh, absolute, which is not possible. There's a comment from Suhail, and then I will ask others to share their comments on the other aspects of the text as well. Um, he says, when you get lost in trying to define absolute, rather than just seeing it as a conclusion. Let me read it again. When you get lost in trying to define absolute, rather than just seeing it as a conclusion, you may forget the experience itself and how his names are manifesting in your life. And you may forget the experience itself and how his names are manifesting in your life. So do not waste your time or do not try to define absolute, otherwise you will forget the experience itself and how his names are manifested in your life. 
he continues, he says, as Abu Bakr says, your incomprehensibility of God mm. is your comprehensibility. Your incomprehensibility of God is your comprehensibility. Is there a, like an English problem in this? Just need that. So he is known by his unknownability. Let's okay, okay, okay, okay. His definition is undefinable. His okay. undefinableness is his definition. So, so if you understand that he's undefinable, that means that you understand I understood him. So our participants, like participants here, online participants, any comments about the text? <laughs> Anything? God, there is no God, but He, His are the most beautiful names. So in the first sentence, it says a king has different titles in the spheres of his government and different names and signs in the levels of his rule. So different styles and attributes, oh, sorry, I skip, okay. A king has different titles in the spheres of his government. So different titles. Uh, we haven't, I guess, discussed about this, why he's talking about different titles of his government and different styles and attributes among the classes of his subjects. Different styles and attributes among the classes of his subjects. So when he's, uh, when he's interacting with people like Yusuf, educated people, let's say, he's interacting with them in a certain style. But when he's interacting with uneducated people of the society, our mayor, he's interacting with them with different style. And different names and signs in the levels of his rule. So his rule also has different levels. And then he gives all these examples. Judge, commander-in-chief, caliph, so on and so forth. He says, if you understand this analogy, you can talk about all these other names as well. Which reminded me, uh, which verse it's part? Which is this, the Hashir? End of Hashir. Okay, end of Hashir, yes. There, he starts with a very similar uh, opening. And then, it continues with all these different names. And at the end, he says, Okay, I'm giving you all these examples. If you understood what I understood, you know, explain you in this passage in Quran, he says, you can apply the same analogy to everything you see. So I guess author is doing the same thing here. He says, okay, these are some examples. Uh, judge, Halif, commander in chief. If you understand this analogy, so apply it to everything you see. So let's try to understand the analogy, like what it means in our life, how we experience this analogy. As a side note, uh, I just uh, went back in this chapter in Quran. So this very famous uh, verse, God is sitting on the throne, is, I guess, the fifth verse in the same chapter. Hmm. So the author is uh, expanding this analogy in there. So Quran is teaching us that as if the creator is a king, Ar-Rahman hmm. ar this was the verse. So and the author is expanding how, where is the kingdom of God? If we had some... Hmm. Kingdom of heaven. <laughs> so, what is the kingdom of God and where, where is the throne? How where is, is he sitting? Yeah, where is he sitting? So, and this is a, a explanation of it. I guess. Where where is he is so, any examples, any comments about these different styles? When you were talking about it, you were saying uh, so a king or a mayor interacts with people differently? 
Is it because he is interacting with people differently or can people only interact with him according to what they know? So maybe he is not interacting with them differently. He's like still the same person. How are people connect with them from their perspective? So in essence, he doesn't interact with them differently. They just understand him differently. So how about your experience? Like how you experience it like when it comes to dean of uh, or president of your company, whatever it's called. Like how you experience it from, forget about the president's side, your side, your point of view. I guess as humans, we do interact with people differently, but I'm just, I don't understand uh, when I think of a creator that interacts with his creation. What, why you are thinking of a create, like even here, uh, so we taking the point of view of the subjects, not the king. Okay, so yes, in the analogy, question. yes, analogy is talking about, he's called talking about a king, but when it comes to your life, you can also certainly talk about yourself. How you interact with king? And your observation of like his interaction with the others. Yes, again, the problem in here is you're trying to define the key here or trying to define the creator and saying that how come he is going to speak differently to each of us still trying to define but if you always stay in this side of the in your sphere and say that we are being treated differently I mean, I am observing mercy nowadays more than anything else Somebody else might be seeing knowledge, wisdom more than anybody else. So definitely this person is being subject to knowledge. I am being subject to mercy. And this is my reality. And where is this coming from? Coming from the absolute source. From the same source, I am being subject to mercy. Somebody else being subject to knowledge. But from his, from the other side, Again, we, we shouldn't be trying to test that. There's no other side. As far as we are concerned, there is no other side. Yeah. I cannot test beyond this boundary, but each and every time I get close to this boundary, just like the, the shortcut, electric shortcut is happening there. Even like the, in the Mirage Prophet, like reaches the ultimate point, like Makam Mahmud, is that what it was? Kabu Kabu Singh. Kabu Kabu Singh. When he reaches the Qabr Qabr which is like like a, the closest like uh, distance possible, do you think that like he was really speaking to the Creator, like and like we speaking to each other? No. <laughs> <laughs> so from my perspective, I experience that I am being treated differently. That's what I know. Uh, so for instance, sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm sad. At this moment, some other people are not feeling the same thing. So when I try to talk about uh, you know anything in this life, I have a certain style of talking about it. Some others have different styles. <coughs> So this is what I experience. I experience like all these different things are manifested in people's life in different ways. Uh, the way I look at the way Osman takes care of his family is different than, let's say, Yusuf is taking care of his family. Osman takes care of that. Sorry? Osman takes care of that. Sure. I see like a similar things, similar qualities, I see mercy there, I see mercy here as well, but they seem like uh, different things at first sight. The same mercy, same concept of mercy, but it takes place in different style. So the question whether this is because, I don't know, Osman is doing something different or I'm perceiving in different or the creator is doing something different I have no idea. This is what I see. I see all these differences. And I guess this is the gist of the uh, topic. Like personally, I think 
this text is talking about all this diversity in the creation. The author says, when you look at the creation, you see all these differences. Mm -hmm. What's going on here? I look at somewhere, I see hatred. I look at another where, where I see love. In my life, sometimes, you know, I experience mercy. Sometimes I experience, uh, I experience punishment. So what's going on? Like, why all these differences? All these chapters before that, we talked about uh, unity, like Tafi. Now we are talking about diversity. Why unity? Exactly. But okay, yes, I will attribute everything to a source. How am I going to deal with all this diversity? What's going on here? I look at somewhere I see mercy that much, I look at another where I see mercy that much. How, how am I going to understand this? I guess this is, at least to me, this is the question. Where is this diversity coming from? Some people, they have miserable, miserable life. I look at them and I see them as being, as they are being tortured. And so I look at other people, they're in very, uh, peaceful, I don't know, luxurious lives. What's going on? What is this difference, I say? Sometimes I see war. Sometimes I see uh, judgment or justice taking place. Am I going to like attribute all these things, things to different, as you were saying, deities? I would say, okay, maybe you know, there's a, a god of war, there is another god of love. What's going on? God of evil, god of goodness, like the Zoroastrians. Any questions, comments, please? So, just a comment. Uh, the way after a month for me, the question, I have been having the same question. So the issue is, I am as if I have a tendency to feel secure if I can hold it in my hands. I want to encapsulate something to feel secure. But the matter now we are discussing, I am trying to interact with the absolute. So although I am expecting it to get security by interacting with him, yet at the same time, I am realizing that he's incomprehensible. So it gives me a contradictory feeling now. I am looking for security, but to the best of my experience, if you like, I tend to have this impression that I can only reach security if I hold something and I encapsulate it, but not get immersed in something. But I encapsulate it, not it encapsulates me. I mean, this sort of a thing that I feel like I'm going to feel security in. Therefore, I am trying to define the absolute one. So, do you think like it's because like you still not use a person, but like uh, the more emotion behind that like uh, approach? Like there is still this uh, claim for yeah, like thing like clinging on to things, like thinking that you are still the uh, like uh, owner of your own life instead of like as he was saying in the 23rd work that believing God requires the uh, reliance on God that like requires the uh, mm -hmm. submission to God so do you think that it's because that there is some struggle still there that's why like uh, you feel the need to control it yourself exactly the reason is I want to say I exist and I know what I mean when I say I exist. And it's not being outsourced. And this is my notion. So you, you want to claim your independence deep inside. Yeah. And you don't want to let that point go. And I am as if, even if you like, take it like a, as thin as a hair, but this one exists independently. And I am defining everything relative to this existence. And when I talk, talk about the ex absolute source, I'm trying to imagine how many of these hairs shall I put together to 
make it as big as him, sort of. But it's still incomprehensible to me what it means to say that this hair does not have a quote unquote, now using this terminology, external existence. What does that mean? So I guess this is the really, uh, if I can truly release it, like surrender this I, whatever that means in practice, then I guess I will be done with such questions, such troubles, not questions, but troubles. Otherwise, again and again, I'm going to fall into the same thing. Because if I do exist independently, then I have to define him relative to me uh, in the sense that I have volume, I have a magnitude. Therefore, must he have also some sort of a magnitude? But I don't know how, I guess this is the issue. Practically, how do I surrender, submit this uh, here? I mean, in theory, yeah, I can like talk about it, but uh, this is where my intellect is struggling. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this is where my intellect is struggling because it is trying to still define. And when I say uh, surrender, there is a part of me which is willing to do it, sort of. Or, and or still, like it's funny, like even when you say that, how do I learn it? Like that is the thing. Actually, you don't learn it; he teaches you. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I don't know. This is just to say that this is a problem. I mean, I mean, that's a we, common we problem. Through that, so. That's a common problem for everybody. It's not just that, like, problem of like individual like, A or B. Like, uh, it is like really interesting that like it slips in your mind. Like, you don't even realize that actually you are doing it. Like, unless you are really, really careful and you are really reflecting on your own like self. Otherwise, like just take it for granted, then you start speaking. Even, I guess, we need to question when I say, I know mercy, for example. I'm defining everything else based on this notion of, I know the sense of mercy, right? What is it that I know? Because everything else is built on top of this initial notion that I take it for granted. What is mercy? Well, you know it when you feel it. This is being my definition of mercy. What do I mean by that though? Suhail says knowing is different than practicing. Ladies, we haven't heard from you, right? Including Hatija Beza. Well, you guys heard from me, I read it. Sorry? You guys heard from me, at least I read it. So. Oh yeah. She just to her like sit there under the bus saying that like she should speak. So, so him raising hand, but so him, I, as far as I remember, you are not a girl. So let's <laughs> wait for ladies first. <laughs> Zainab. Oh, Hatija Beza says something. Okay, just nothing. Okay, so then it's your turn. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> you know, I kind of find it interesting in the first branch. Um, he says a sultan has different titles in the Sirius government and different styles and attributes among the classes of his subjects and different names and signs in the level of his role. Um, then he gives examples. Uh, you understand that a single sultan may possess a thousand names and titles in the sphere of his rule and levels of government. You know, what's, you know, you know <clears throat> interesting is that, you know, Norsi, by using this verse, is showing you how all things within the universe, including what's happening in your own life, are under the regulation of a single one. But, you know, in day-to-day -day life, it's, as you guys were saying, it's, like I don't, I don't really think about that. I think about like, oh, I have my life, and I do as I please, and I choose, and I will. But then everything else out there is under the rule of this king. But that king doesn't have any sort of rule over me. Um, and I, to me, you kind of see that reflected in society. Um, 
by and large. Um, and you also may even see that, well, not may, but you definitely see that reflected, let's say, in, uh, let's say, education, in that there is this subject and that subject and this subject and another subject, and they're all sort of distinct subjects, and they have their own sort of um, foundation, let's say, science or math or history or let's say literature, they're all sort of distinct and their own compartments, their own rooms. Um, but sometimes we never think that what we consider like, let's say science out there, the study of the universe, uh, it's really just speech. So when you think about it in the frame of just science, you are sort of doing a disservice to what's actually taking place. It's not just some reaction, you know, there's something else at play here. Um, otherwise, why would two different people, a scientist and a poet, can look to the same things in the world and one can write about how this plant is growing and the other can write about what it makes them feel. Um, and to me, this is sort of a really important aspect of what Norsi is saying here, at least to me, is that you can, there are all of these things taking place, but they're all taking place by, you know, they're, they, um, all these different things that are being demonstrated they're all coming from the same king. Um, and they're, he's acting with all his names, whether you're aware of it or not, honestly. So some people, they're always concerned about, let's say, uh, justice or knowledge. But how about maybe there's something like mercy or compassion or wisdom there too? You know, because in, in, in, in science, no one ever thinks about, like, that's not really the concern. What are you talking about? It's mercy out there. There's, they're focused on knowledge, if you think about it, or will, for that matter. But how is it possible that two different people can look at the same thing and speak of different things? Um, and... To me, the Quran, like, if you think about it, that verse is sort of giving you the premise or foundation of a true analysis of the universe. And Jazakallah Khair, would you like to say something? I thought you were to. No? She, she looks very puzzled since the beginning. Oh, okay. Go oh, good. <laughs> if you like to say she, has, she has a lot of things to say, but I'm not sure why she's keeping quiet. Osama, you seem like you're my spokesperson, so you can <laughs> deliver the question as well. Um, um, <laughs> where do I start? I mean, there just seems to be a lot going on in this first branch um, in general. And um, I was, I was, I guess, still stuck on. I was still thinking about the different styles aspect of it. Um, like, how is it that I interact with the just judge, or how is that different from the commander in chief in, in the ways that it reflects in my life? Um, I don't have anything concrete to verbalize right now about it. Um, and I don't want to completely uh, dismiss what Sahil was saying by not you know, letting other people comment on what he's saying. Um, if you guys want a question, here's one question. Um, <laughs> um, I was thinking um, in the last sentence, which is like four lines, he says, it is as if through his corporate personality and telephone, the ruler is present and knowing every sphere. Okay. And through his laws and regulations, representatives sees and is seen. Um, and I can understand the is seen aspect of it, right, through different 
qualities that I can come to know um, the king. But the C's part of it, through his laws and regulations of representative C's, um, I mean, maybe maybe that aspect again doesn't look to me, but if, if this is supposed to be an analogy that is exactly the same in, in the author's words, um, what does it mean for, it seems like there's a sort of intermediary through which, um, I guess everything here is, looks at you. So author, I, I don't think he's talking about, it. well, let me tell you about, uh, right. you know, how King sees. But I mean, it also seems like he, he is talking of the, like the, the whole paragraph seems very, dictated from the king's perspective rather than the subjects the, uh, even though it's, it's more descriptive than it is so even the rest like when the uh, author talks about uh, the god he talks about uh, rights at least as if it's from uh, god's perspective he says the sustainer of all the worlds who is the ruler of pre-eternity and post-eternity in degrees in the degrees of his dominicality, he has attributes and designations which are all different, but which look to each other. So when he writes, he's definitely is not uh, saying that he must be has these uh, have these attributes. All his name must be looking to each other. He doesn't say. I guess the question is, uh, how should we understand or read these? And there's other things that we can talk about and say about this must be is whatever things, but uh, I don't think this is part of the uh, discussion. Right now. Anyway, yeah. Like, just to add it to, to your question, like another question very quick. Uh, maybe this will also go back to the, his like incomprehensibility and like being absolute, but like he, in that uh, last, uh, sentence he says uh, behind the veil in every degree it disposes and sees governs observes through his degree knowledge and power so that's for the like obviously he's talking for the king as an example that's the analogy and he's going to apply that to the creator right but uh, he is the one who is disposes sees observes every single action so again like uh, I think that's kind of speaking like say like about the king or about the creator and these are the aspects that looks to him what they truly mean i don't know but like uh so for example like what it, what does it really mean for creator to be able to to to be closer to me like closer than juggler being and disposing like having a disposal over every single action in the creation but at the same time, going back to that 70,000 whales, I think it also, there is an aspect that looks pro, looks to that like uh, concept as well. So do, oh, wait, please. No, I mean, I was just, um, maybe, maybe going back again to uh, the different styles part of it. Um, you know, uh, diff different levels, different, According to the class of the subjects, you know, it kind of poses the question to me initially of, so what? Um, but I guess it's it's about, you know, if going with this example, if, you know, as you were saying, the mayor of, of Philadelphia appeals to different demographics, right? Probably if it's election time, divides the city into certain demographics, and then, um, uh, design certain or uh, marketing uh, tactics according to those demographics and appeals to them within specific ways. Um, but if I'm thinking of an absolute creator, then let alone being generalized into specific demographics, like I'm the experiences and interactions that I'm that are being created for me are being completely personalized to my very existence, not just to my general demographic or the category of people I belong to, but 
down to you know all of my tendencies and the type of person I am and the type of choices I make and my likes and dislikes like all of all of it is being specifically uh, personalized uh, for me as a subject. Um, I mean, I don't have I don't have anything that goes in there with it. You guys caught me all off guard saying I have questions, but I just I just thought that that's it's a feeling of immense security knowing that, you know, uh, every every experience that I have, every encounter that I have, um, every interaction I have with my advisor or with a certain colleague, like all of it, is um, is part of the specific if you will, developmental plan for Aishinur, um, for me to grow in my understanding of my reality. Um, and that none of it is, is wasteful, in that none of my, no aspect, no moment of my experience is wasteful. Uh, well, first Suhail and then Khatijah, they raise their hands. Uh, please Suhail, go ahead and then Khatijah, please. Um, well, I was just going to say what Osman had said was that uh, Nor Norsi is, at least the way he writes, is he's finding a comparative example and analogy of trying to understand um, what the sustainer of the worlds, how he must operate. So he uses the example that he can compare to in this universe, the example of a king or a sultan or a caliph for that matter. Um, so it, it may seem Nursi is like speaking traditionally, but I think if you really read, um, and you also have to consider who his audience is, but if you really, I guess, probe into what he's saying, he's not saying that he is this because it ha like he's not he let me put it this way he's not using the quran and saying oh he's this because that's what it says but he's saying he is that because look at the universe and look at what's what's happening in the universe and this is how things operate within the universe so he has to be the same way if he's the one that made it so um just backtracking just a little bit um based on Aishinur's comment and also what um Sohail and Osman said um you know like this act of trying to compartmentalize God's qualities for myself um and the manifestation of the king or the the sultan in these different roles i guess as far as i'm concerned or as far as i can confirm for myself um based on my capacity and my need in a particular situation whatever that situation is um i become aware of the different qualities or roles or certain things become highlighted for me um, based on or in reference to my position um, and what I feel the greatest need for or what I feel the lacking of or what um, in particular is um, specially highlighted for me in that particular situation, whether I feel a need for justice, or I feel a need for mercy, or I feel a need for compassion. Um, so I, what, one thing in my mind is, you know, in my experiencing of compassion in a particular situation, um, it doesn't render that, that experience, uh, it, it doesn't mean that that experience or the source of that compassion lacks the other qualities like justice or mercy or power or wisdom um but rather in I, I guess in that compassion being highlighted for me it tells me 
it gives me a sense of security of for on one hand like of the other qualities because i experience them at at other times and also of you know going back to what i was saying about this you know personalized syllabus or like in in that particular experience i know it's all very theoretical um but feeling the need for that um uh compassion in that particular situation and it could, it could also be like you know like a similar experience though no one experience is ever identical um where certain things are highlighted um but looks like time is up and i don't want to take up more time but yeah thank you subhanak la ilma lana illa ma 'allamtana innaka antal alim al hakim al fatiha